Bueno, eh, bueno, es, es como acá en Colombia, el tocayo John, eh, gracias por estar en el, en el canal, la verdad estamos muy agradecidos. Bueno, yo quiero comenzar en preguntándole sobre, eh, hay un filme que la verdad es muy entrañable, que para mí es uno de los favoritos, porque todas tus películas son favoritas, Sweet Kings. Y me gustaría saber sobre, no solo trabajar con actores de renombre, sino cómo fue la evolución que tuvo, que aún la película sigue siendo recordada en cuestión de las metáforas y más en tu personaje que siempre era aguerrido. ¿Cómo usted desempeñó un rol que la verdad sigue perdurando en la actualidad? Ok, we are going early, early in your career with, with Swing Kids. And what do you think that are the characteristics that, because it's one of the favorite movies from John, by the way, Uh, that get that your character, that very fierce character, uh, perduring time because it's a movie from a long time, but we still remember it. Tell us. Okay. Um, yeah, it is a long time ago. It's a very odd thing that that movie was never as successful as it should have been. It somehow went under the radar, and I don't know why, because it has an incredible cast attached to it. Um, great director. So why exactly that, that didn't hit the mark as it did, but has become the cult movie it is, because when you watch it, it's an extremely good movie. Um, how does one get into that character? Curiously enough, I <laughs> he's not my first Nazi and probably won't be my last one. And for some reason, and it's not because I'm British, because... I get to pay, play bad people, I, I th or, or nasty people, perhaps. And I think there must be something about my physiognomy, and there must be something about my face that makes people think that, oh, yeah, he'll be a good baddie. Um, I suppose I, I, I'm cast a lot out here as a European, so I suppose I look vaguely Germanic. I have got uh, German um, blood in me, German, French, Russian, Um, Swedish uh, as well as Scottish and Irish so I don't know whether that lends itself I always find when playing someone who, who is considered to be a particularly evil type, it is a particularly evil action that he delivers in the film to Robert Sean Leonard um, taking the ashes of Liv Ullman's husband to be delivered um, You've still got to find some humanity within the character. Uh, however black they are painted, they, there are reasons why they are who they are. I, I, I am of the, the belief that everyone, no one is born evil. Um, be, people gain that through external situations, generally speaking, um, which affects them psychologically. So, you, you know, I mean, this guy was handing over dead people's ashes to the brown shirts to deliver to their loved ones. And then one assumes going home to sit down and have dinner with his wife and children. This was a job as far as he was concerned. Uh, his ideology, he felt this was the right thing to be doing. Um, so somehow you've got to find that element within the character that makes him an everyday person and not just someone who's it's very easy with the germans in particular because they are a very straight down the line they do everything by the rule book um and there's this this formality to them this rigidity to them uh this is an awful generalization but i'm actually talking more about that period uh, and also you know he's uh, effectively a military man as well so you know he's got all of that within his character so yes that, and, and of course yes very i remember because i've actually just worked with christian bale on something else earlier last year so it's very interesting for me to have worked not with him but i when i was first on set when i first arrived we shot this in Prague, and that was very interesting in itself because we were filming a, a lot of my my interior was the barandov studios The famous Barandov Studios in Prague. But the exterior locations were buildings 
that still had the shell marks and bullet marks from when the Nazis invaded Prague. In them. And the very curious thing of seeing Czechs dressed as SS officers um, and, and how that affected them as well. And, and that is a lot, again, of how you get into character. It's what you're wearing. The one thing that I've, I, I learned from uh, many older actors uh, is how to get into your character. Before you actually start filming, go to wardrobe, if you can, a couple of days beforehand and ask if you can borrow the shoes or whatever your footwear is, because that very de much determines how you hold yourself and how you walk, whether it's a pair of boots, a pair of brogues, a pair of sneakers, whatever it is you're wearing lends itself to your character. You find, you find a position from, from being rooted from down up as well. And it's not just the work, the character study and the text study that you do. Um, there are elements like that, which also help, obviously. I mean, he was in a very, you know, well-tailored, tight-fitting suit. Um, so that aspect also does help. But, but yes, I, I, when I first went on set for the costume check from the director, they were filming another scene from across the bridge, which wasn't the, the uh, Charles Most. It was another bridge out in Prague. Um, down at the end was Christian Bale and Robert Sean Leonard getting ready for a scene. And he was then 19, Christian, I think, at that point. But uh, I, never, I never actually got to meet him on that occasion. I was really, as you saw, I only worked with Robert. So I traveled with Robert in an, in, uh, you know, to and from the hotel and to the set from Wenceslas Square on several occasions. And the one thing, the only thing I remember is he's only a young lad at that point, is he really hated, hated being away from home. He never, he's gonna, I should never, probably not be saying this, but he never left his hotel room. When, unless he was on set, he never, never set foot outside. Um, to walk around and explore Prague. Uh, and and uh, it was his birthday there, in fact, when we were filming. Uh, and underneath the hotel was a bowling alley. So, uh, so he, his, his birthday was celebrated in the bowling alley. And that's pretty much where he, he sort of stayed. Um, but yeah, that, that was my, my time at Swing Kids. Uh, and it was, a, you know, it was a great moment. It was a wonderful experience. And as you see, you know, Liv Ullman is in that, Kenneth Branner is in that. Uh, Robert Sean Leonard, of course. So, yeah, uh, and just such a great story as well. And very well directed. No, no. Wow. Estoy maravillado. De hecho, es una de las mejores experiencias que he tenido. Vamos con un filme que la verdad sí quiero tener el honor de poder preguntárselo porque yo sé que él ha tenido entrevistas y yo estoy seguro que no le han hecho esta pregunta y es Hecho Doctor. Es una historia sobre la inteligencia artificial involucra a la familia y el futuro. ¿Cómo usted cree que, desde su perspectiva como actor, más en, en el tema de cinéfilo, ¿cómo cree que la... ¿Cómo fue esa caracterización o cómo será más, más adelante las películas en el futuro retratando sobre las familias, decidiendo de que ya no quiero hacer este tipo de, de actividades, sino contrato a un juego para que haga esto? ¿Cómo se imagina el futuro en las películas de esa manera? Ya pronto ya estamos por tener esa realidad. Okay, this is a question that John was dying to do because he really loved Echo Doctor. And he said, in your experience in this movie, but also as, as a cinephile, uh, how do you think that the movies that, I don't know, that some directors are going to make in this near future are going to deal with this kind of sci-fi because yes it's a, a sci-fi but it's more close to the, the lights to the lights that we live now than or a few to tell it man crumbs yes crikey i did that when i first arrived in los angeles 11 years ago 11 years ago i think it is um nearly actually ooh, yeah 11 years ago Um, it's very interesting because, yes, at that point, having spoken to the writer was also the director. And, and he had created this and got it very close to, to being picked up by a major studio. 
Uh, and in fact, he, he himself, I don't, I don't know whether he still is, but he was a script doctor. So he was a, a writer that comes in on big movies, very much like Phoebe Waller-Bridge did with James Bond recently with No Time to Die. She was brought in to, to lift it up to, to a different level that they felt was required, this whole thing about the Bond franchise and films at this point where they're trying to make uh, greater equality, less misogynism, and give the women some meteor roles. And so she came in to do that and to actually put a bit more humor into it as well. And that's very much what um, our guy was doing uh, uh, and before he created his own film. He was stepping in to help out with major films that were having a problem. And so he decided, he, he was so frustrated he couldn't get this made that he made it himself obviously in a slightly uh, smaller budget than, uh, than he was hoping for. But um, yes, it's very interesting when you're working on something where the, where the subject matter is sci-fi, but actually is far more close to, to where we're heading. Um, and it always, I mean, it surprises me now when we, we, we watch what we do and we see how the world is developed and having read H.G. Wells, when he wrote, when he did, and everything that he said would happen has happened. Um, the way that we do have these devices that we hold in our hand. Um, uh, uh, you know, we now have these small screens. And look at Blade Runner. Who knew that eventually all these skyscrapers would have living billboards on them? The way we see them all over Tokyo, all over now um, Piccadilly Circus in London, and of course Times Square. Uh, we even have the blimp flying overhead with a moving image on the side of it. So it is fascinating when you do do see this come to life and actually, well, you know, that this isn't science fiction anymore. This is science fact. And then you wonder then what will be the next science fiction? What will that be? And where, where and how long will it be before we reach that and it ceases to be that? I think we're already beginning to see that slightly with artificial intelligence and the attempt to actually create create robots that, that communicate and uh, with with us in real time and can actually digest the, the conversation that is being had and respond immediately. That's quite alarming. Um, the technology where you know we can we can bring Marilyn Monroe back to life. And we can put her in a whole new movie, uh, and it sounds like her, and it looks like her, and it isn't her. We've seen that that being done on social media very cheekily with uh, Tom Cruise, um, and so we are aware how images can be manipulated, how our mind can be manipulated to accept what we are watching is real. So yeah, I I do find that fact very fascinating. Black Mirror is that terrifying series where you see so much it's like. But this is happening. This is really happening. That awful episode where everybody was really keen to have as many likes as possible on their social media. And if they didn't, they didn't exist. Um, that's almost real. <laughs> that is real. As far as some people are concerned, especially influencers these days. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, you do wonder, well, what is coming next? Because we are now sending people to Mars. That is happening very soon. I think, unfortunately, they're all going on a one-way trip. As far as I can make out, they haven't worked out how to get them back. But um, And already people are, are creating uh, living spaces underwater. So, yes, you're quite right. Sci-fi, I mean, how long before we do have the Starship Enterprise? How long before we do have um, craft of that size and that ability and being, being able to travel at warp speed? How long before those those things flying above us in the air, carrying us from A to B, no longer need to be necessary because we'll just press a button, dematerialize and rematerialize wherever it is we want to be. Now, that'll be a killer for the airlines. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it it is fascinating, and I would love to do more of that. Um, and who knows? You know, and one never knows what's around the corner. That's the whole beauty of what I do. Uh, nothing is nothing is definite. <laughs> and you give me a data that one friend will love because I got a friend that is really a fan from the Bond franchise. And it's crazy because you, I, I look to you, I, to you INDV, and yes, you appear in one of the National Treasure movies, the, of course, the sequel. But I really 
you 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 got the yes, the the tie to appear on a beat I'm no bone movie but on a beat a spice movie uh, I don't know I, I I really it's crazy because uh I really want to see you in that kind of projects but John they have a pregunta I don't but I want to tell um, in general because there is something amazing this is question is for myself there is something amazing I see in what you tell me that you appear in movies that man we watch it and we feel this movie really needs to be more known and not only for the for the the, 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 the characters of the story but for the directors you have the look to work with people like Stephen Gag and like and I and, and I want to do with you an homage to Jean Marc Valen. Rest in peace. You appear uh -huh. in, in in that amazing movie from the, the John Victoria, if I know. Just how do this? No, I want I want to ask you this. Or John, see, I will ask you this. This I got this question from the end, but I really want to make it now because I was watching the projects that you are going to do next. I don't, I don't know if you can talk about that. But it's crazy because you will appear in a project with David Russell that is an amazing director. Is an actor that is a director that you say, "Wow, one movie from him I need to watch." It. But the old, the old, the another thing that I find crazy is that you will appear in an adaptation that it was impossible because I'm a reader and I know that that Ulysses is like an Odyssey. And that's crazy, man. If you want to tell us about how is working with these amazing directors or these movies that we can I will thank you. Sure. Um, David, o, David and Russell, that, that is a very interesting film because currently at the moment, it still doesn't have a title. And he has a, a, a quite an interesting approach. This, this project has been, he's been working on this now for five years, apparently prior to our filming this at the beginning of last year. Um, it is so top secret that I wasn't allowed to see the script. I wasn't even allowed to see my pages um, until I arrived. Um, and it, I can I can say it's set in nineteen. I think it's set in nineteen thirty six. I think that is the date, and I can say that because pictures were taken with the filming on location on the streets of Los Angeles. Uh, and so they, you know, they were seen in their costumes of that period. And those, those are uh, Margot Robbie and Christian Bale and J.D. Washington. Um, and Mike, Mike Myers may not have been in that, but those were the four principal actors and they are one, two, three, and four on the, on the shooting list. So they are the four principal actors uh, that, and I was working with them on this particular scene that I was doing which we shot on the Queen Mary, which was doubling as uh, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel of that period. Um, but more than that, I can't tell you, I'm not allowed to. And, and also because I don't know, because I didn't see the script. But um, you, what I was gonna say here is, it was fascinating therefore to watch how he worked. When I auditioned for this, and I auditioned for the producer who has been David's producer on all those big, movies um, uh, so Silver Lining Playbook The Hustle etc and um, so my audition was just to tell a story that's all they wanted me to do sit in front of the camera and tell a story something that is true uh, and beyond it could be funny it could be shocking it could be whatever so that is what I did and subsequently got the call back with the producer and with the two casting directors. Loved what I did for the callback. They said they wanted to know my availability. Have I been vaccinated? And am I happy with improvisation? I don't have a problem with improvisation. Because they said, this is how David is going to work. I'm not going to have a script. He's going to give you the line. So he's going to feed you the line. Then you say the line. I said, OK. And so that's what they did. They, not from the script but they fed me some lines that they then wanted me to, to give back with the appropriate emotion or feeling. And that's how I booked the job. 
So I I arrived, and it, was, and it is, they were the first big major um, studio production to go back into production with all the COVID restrictions. So it was unfortunate in that respect that, yes, normally you're used to being able to go to craft services, to be sat with each other, you get to talk to each other, you get to connect. We couldn't do any of that. Whenever we cut, everyone put on their face masks. They all went off to their separate corners until they were called back. You rehearsed in the face mask. The difficulty, well, and also the brilliant cameraman that we have on that, who's the cameraman on The Revenant, uh, who has his crew all around him. Well, there's no way they can be six foot apart from each other. It's physically impossible. And they did have these weird things like little tiny key fobs that they had on their person so that if they got closer than six feet, they vibrated uh, to warn you and tell you to keep back, which they had to stop using because, of course, you're trying to shoot a film and people are obviously w walking around and getting closer than they should be and suddenly these things are beeping and take. So those actually had to be shut down. Um, but when I arrived, I watched, I, I watched him directing them as they were coming into the scene and then in my scene. It was fascinating. Because Margot Robbie, he, he would say this to all of them. He said, now, now deliver this line. Now deliver this line. Um, now, and then he would say a line, and they had to repeat it. Then he would say, now go back to the original line. Now lean forward. Now lean back. And that was fascinating for me, because I've never seen a director do that while you're actually shooting a scene. And this isn't a scene that has no um, sound. This is a talking scene. Um, so I was really fascinated. He was, he's very hands-on. He's very, very touchy-feely. So that, and he couldn't stop himself from being that, even though we're, we had this um, compliance officer running around with a big card on his back saying six foot to make sure you kept your distance. And he'd always pop in and say, could you put your mask up? You need to put your mask up? Uh, and we had a whole load of extras around us as well. They all, you know, it was, it was quite, a, uh, quite a feat. Um, and I had to have a COVID test 18 days, every day, every day for 18 days before we went on set. We all had to have COVID tests, plus the COVID test on the day, on the set. Um, they were really taking care. But when you look at the cast list of who's in this film, I was playing a cameo role. Well, so, I mean, every, anyone who's, who's, who's anyone is in there. Um, Robert De Niro's in this movie. I mean, the, it just it's a huge cast list. But we know nothing more than that. We don't, we, it still has no title. It still has no release date. I believe it's coming out this year. But it was, yeah, it was fascinating to work with him. Um, Jean-Marc Vallée, what can I say? Jean-Marc Vallée, God rest his soul, very, very talented, very clearly that. But boy, was he feisty. I mean, when, when I was on set, it was, uh, it was very interesting. I mean, you know, I've read about um, him on set with Big Little Lies and having shouting matches with Reese Witherspoon. Um, and he's yeah, he's got that. He's got a. He's got. A, I guess it's one can put it down to his creative temperament. I have no idea, but he was he was very interesting to work with. He seemed to have a very short fuse um, during the time that we were, that I was filming with him. But uh, he gets the results, as you see. The Young Victoria is a beautiful film. And really the film, I, I believe, that launched Emily Blunt. Um, apart from Prada, of course. Um, the Devil Wears Prada. Um, but, but this was really her coming into her own, taking her own leading role. And from there, the rest is history. So it, it is fascinating when you get an opportunity to work with these directors and I, I don't know whether it's my age, but I suppose because I am the age I am, as much as I do revere them, I don't fear them. And, and that is something that's very important when you're working on set, you, you, because they want you to, co co to collaborate with them. And if you're someone that's shrinking back and, and are frightened to open your mouth, then, you know, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for someone that can step up to the mark to work with the actors of the caliber that you're facing. Um, uh, and I've been very fortunate in the number of, of named actors that I've had the opportunity to work opposite. You learn so much from them. 
And they will say very, very sweetly, they say, well, we're only as good as the actors we're working opposite. So, um, yeah, Steve Gagan, why Gold was never successful, it is extraordinary. Again, it's a great film, but for whatever reason, it didn't, it didn't receive uh, the critical acclaim he felt that his work is worthy of. Matthew McConaughey gave a great performance. They all did. Um, but for some reason, it just didn't, it didn't strike a nerve. Um, and that was very interesting for me because I was born in 1960. So I was 20 in 1980. And this is a film that was set in the 1980s. And we were shooting it at a very, very famous restaurant that was meant, um, meant to have Rothko paintings around it originally. But Rothko at the last minute removed them because he felt he didn't want his paintings amongst a bunch of, of rich people who didn't give them monkeys as to what was surrounding them. So he withdrew them and they're now in a museum in Washington, DC. But we were filming on locations. Historic restaurant, sadly, isn't there anymore. It's gone. And a, a huge number of extras around. And I, and I overheard one of them say, I do love being in a period movie. And I thought, my God, a per I thought a period movie was in the 1700s, 1600s, 1800s. You're saying a 1980 movie is a period movie. And I was alive then. So it, so it was. It brought home a bit of reality to to me, as well. Um, but it was it was great fun to work on. I remember we had a break at, at dinner, and the younger actors who were who were recurring throughout the film that he he takes on to to assist him. They believe in a genuine deal, not realizing he takes them all out to the gold mine, and we broke for for supper. And one of them just didn't want to have what we were being served, and he said, "We'll have." I'm going to, he went to the best burger joint if there is in Manhattan, got a whole load of burgers. And then we sat on the, on the steps of Matthew McConaughey's trailer in the streets of Manhattan, eating burgers and chips. It was so surreal <laughs> um, in between the shoot. So, um, so I have a very fond memory. I have a very fond memory of, of, of everything, really, including Jean-Marc Vallée's scenes that I was doing with, with Emily. Yeah, I know. I, you also have to accept, and this is the thing I learned. I remember friends being really chuffed that I was in this young Victoria. And uh, uh, and Taya, it was a girlfriend at the time, that took me along with a whole lot of her friends. I don't appear. My scene was actually edited out. However, you hear my voice. You hear my voice as I go down. And, I, and as, as I read the scene, I thought, he's not even going to have the camera on me. I know he isn't, because there's some very important dialogue that's going on whilst I'm coming down to swear my allegiance to my niece. There's some very important uh, dialogue going on uh, along with the Prime Minister um, and the Duke of Wellington, uh, which is Paul Bettany and um, Julian Glover. So I knew, I thought, I'm not in this, I'm sure of this, I'm sure that maybe this has been shot. So you, and the, the same thing happened with National Treasure too. I was in the trailer but not in the movie. So it, this, I mean, this, is, this we know happens a lot where, you know, you think you're in it and finally you, you, you come to see it. You think, so I, I have to feel that with David and Russell. I'm fairly, I'm fairly, I know from the scene, I know I'm this because that's what I do in the scene. So I, it would be um, impossible for me to come out of it. But, uh, but hey, who knows? You never know. They might say, well, the whole of that scene, I can get it. See, we, we don't need that. The film is too long. So you are at the mercy of, of the producers at the end of the day who want the final cut that they feel is going to create the box office that they're looking for um, and for the editor to to make those decisions with the director so yeah you never know <laughs> before the question a crazy data i remember everything uh, edgar ramirez is kind of in the, in the in the past he was like a, a neighbor because we live in Cúcuta. Cúcuta is the border with Venezuela. He's from San Cristóbal. San Cristóbal uh -huh. is only two hours from here. But, That's you know, true. for the politics, we can now uh, travel to San Cristóbal, but in the old times. And in fact, he really, before the, the craziness, and he's an amazing actor, he walked in the streets of Cúcuta. It's crazy. And he's such a lovely, a lovely guy, too. A really lovely guy. Uh, and a brilliant actor. So, and then he gave such a great performance in this too. And that's why, again, 
something. Why did this not register? We don't know. You know, look, West Side Story was meant to be a huge this reimagining and recreation by Steven Spielberg, completely flopped in the box office. Got some fabulous young actors in there. I mean, Rachel Zegler is phenomenal in this film. And she's Colombian. Indeed, she is, and proud of it. Uh, and such a great actress. Um, so I'm thrilled for her that we're going to see more of her. You know, because she's playing Snow White. That's the next thing she's doing. And it's crazy because you're the second person in this channel. The other one was Steven Tobolowski. Then tell us that West Side Story is a masterpiece. <laughs> why is not? It is an amazing film. I mean, it's just why people. I think I think that they're you know they're feeling that musicals just aren't really now a good fit as as cinema. I don't know. Les Miserables was a successful, uh, you know. Uh, transfer from musical to screen. West Side Story has been previously, but yes, where are we now? We know that Generation X and the current generation that's going to be the next main cinema goer very much are, are focused on um, superhero movies and movies that have as much CGI as possible thrown into them. Art house movies are not such a, a draw, uh, and occasionally one of them will slip through and have success. So. You were really at the mercy, uh, as the industry always is, with the audience and what the audience want, uh, which is why they, they pay so much attention to that. And they have these screen tests before the film is finally released, where they bring in people off the street to find out exactly you know, whether they've got the right cut, whether this is a film that's going to satisfy an audience and bring in the record-breaking box office figures that they're looking for. One remembers this is called show business because it is more business than show these days. John, wow. dale, última pregunta. Sí, yo quiero finalizar con algo que te voy a decir. También conecta a la pregunta que hizo Andrés y es, en Ulises hace parte Cecil de la Piel, que ah. obviamente sabemos de que ella siempre estuvo involucrada en los trabajos de John Perkins, pero del maestro acá presente es lo más importante saber de que hay un cortometraje que él va a escribir y que va a ser parte de ella que se llama Tren Coach. Tren Coach es para nosotros la más esperada porque, eh, no sé, siento que era más personal de él y también en preguntarle sobre cómo fue la experiencia en una vida a Fable of Music. Eso sería todo. Y también felicitar, si tenemos tiempo, a Cecil porque ella hizo Bay. Me encantó. Mm, first, uh, as a final, we want to also congratulate. We know that she is now from there to just Cecil de la Pierre because uh, John really wants to see, and of course myself, not, uh, I'm the translator, but I'm also signify. We want to see Trench Coat. We feel that it's one of the most personal projects. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, and if you want to talk, of course, about a fable of music and the mind, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, and this is a very, this is very, very true. And, uh, quite simply, I, I would not be who I am or where I am. I have the success that I have done um, in the short period of time that I've been out in the States, were it not for Cecile, my wife, because one is hugely reliant, um, immeasurably so in that support uh, and she has been more than that she's been a co-creator with me. she created my diary of a failed actor um which we then called a diary of an actor because my american friends said you can't call it that you can't call a series failed a diary of a failed actor and um and i said well the reason is it's a joke actually because when i was first out of drama school and i was staying at, at uh, having a lunch with friends And their daughter came in with, with the school friend. And um, they were introduced at the table to uh, Mrs. Johnny, and he's, he's an actor. And the, the friend, they were about 13, piped up and said, oh, my uncle is a failed actor like you too. <laughs> really? What does that mean? Um, and so I, I called it that because, you know, I, I don't believe in failure. I believe you are a, you are a success in what you do. The fact that I am doing what I do, the fact 
fact that there are people out there who are doing what they love, no matter at what level they are, they are doing what they love. And so few of us in this world get that opportunity. We are very privileged as filmmakers, as actors, to be able to do what we love. And the fact that we are managing to still do that against all the odds um, and achieving that, that is a success, whether you're just starting or you're up at the, up, up at the top. So Cecile created that series with me. She's created a number of projects, Almost There um, is another one, which she won an award for, uh, several awards, and was nominated for, which I, I helped her with. But she wrote that. Um, Trenchcoat came about rather interestingly because we have a devilishly good-looking, very talented young French nephew called Mali. And, um, and he was staying with us when we were in New York. And we just decided, and Cecile really said, you know, let's make a film with Mali. Let's make Mali the star of this film. Uh, and so they got me to sort of create a storyline and a script, uh, and it became Trenchcoat, which, um, you know, he has a superpower in which he, he can draw people very quickly and also rub them out of a situation so that the, the person that's threatening you can be removed with the line of a pencil and simply by scrolling up the piece of paper and chucking it in the waste bin. So it's a, it's a short short. Um, it has been completely shot. It just needs to be edited. So that, uh, that, and then of course other projects have turned up and Cecile has been engaged with those. I'm not in a position to finalize them, but she will do. And she is, she's also a very talented and brilliant actress. She was in High Maintenance, wonderful series filmed out in New York. Um, and she's now doing a lot of, uh, a, a lot of audiobook narration at present, but uh, she's also auditioning for film and television. Uh, and in fact, we're looking to acquire her an agent in the UK as well to enable her to do more in Europe as well. So, um, so yes, I'm very glad you brought Cecile up because she is a very central part of, of my life. Uh, and, and without her, I really, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now, as simple as that. As you know, because without her, I had no audio. <laughs> I, need, I needed her to press the button as well so that I could speak to you. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very touched that you brought Cecile up. So she deserves recognition. Thank you. In fact, John was telling me that we, as a finale, not only thank you to you, but Cecile, well, I want to tell you something because, yes, you were talking to now as the future that cinema with the superheroes, no, it's crazy because we didn't take these subjects, but yes, you had to know that here in Latin America, people is crazy with their devil, with the teeth, the teeth guard, the teeth guard, they're, they're fanatics. And John, John is really a fan, John, billions. <laughs> We interviewed here. We we interviewed here <laughs> Malachi White. Malachi White. In fact, we had people here also from Godson, from Godson. Uh, but man, thank you so much, John. The camera is yours. Uh, please say your social media so people can follow you. Send a bit hi to the channel, to Colombia, to Latin America, whatever you want. If you want to talk about another project by Shindia or anything, the camera is yours, man. We are okay. so thankful. Okay. Well, indeed, thank you very, very much. I, I feel very, uh, very privileged to be here. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, I would love to come to Colombia. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think if any of my my family have been, and I don't think they have as yet. But uh, but from uh, you know, I know it to be a, such a beautiful country from what I have seen in documentaries. So I, I do need to make that effort. And I'm not very far. <laughs> I'm just you know just a touch away from it so it's, there's no excuse really um so i'd love to do that and to see you in person that would be great um so yeah i can talk about chindia a little bit um chindia very interestingly is uh, a chinese south asian indian rom-com thriller which interestingly by the director and the writer created this through through data and statistics to work out where the biggest audiences are in cinema, India and China. So they created this project 
to appeal to um, to both those audiences. It's a very funny, very well written script. Um, I play a very sleazy English lawyer who talks like that because he's you know he's from the south air, southeast of London, so he's a bit of a geezer and he's not someone you can really trust. Not quite a nasty person or an evil person. He's a bit of an anti-hero. Um, so that for me was really great fun. The whole crew were Indian. Uh, they were absolutely fantastic to work with. Uh, AJ Singh is the star. He's quite a well-known uh, South Asian Indian uh, comic actor based out here in Los Angeles. He was such a sweet guy to work with. Um, Billions was amazing. The short time that I was on it, it was very brief with, of course, an amazing director on board who, who directed Desperately Seeking Susan with um, Madonna, um, but it was all too brief. Sadly, not with Damien because my whole car, <laughs> I was on the phone with him and he was on a jet, he was on a private jet. So I never actually got to work with him. Um, Daredevil was fabulous. I was only meant to be on it for a day and I ended up being on it for six episodes, I think. But it was it was a, it was terrifying for me because I went for the audition to Julie Schubert, and she said we need an Englishman who can speak fluent Japanese. I said well, I can't. They said no, we know that. So we've written down these two lines. If you could say them phonetically in Japanese on a self tape, so we can send to the producers. I did that. She was ecstatic and said, "You you are you are what? If you had lines in Japanese, could you say them?" And I said, yeah, sure. I've got, if I have them in time, and I've got a friend who lives in out of Japan, speaks Japanese, so hopefully I could reach him. Fine, perfect. I got booked. And this was about four weeks, five weeks, four weeks, five weeks before we started filming. No script, no script. We're now two weeks away. No script. What the heck's going on? Here? A week before we start filming, the script arrives with twenty lines in English, not in Japanese, that I had to translate into Japanese and then learn. So I thought, okay, couldn't get hold of my friend, used Google <laughs> to translate these lines and learn them. I was two days away from going on and I managed to learn the first 10 and the last 10 would not go in. And Cecile said, my wife said, just do what you do when you're learning a language. Just write it down. So I did that and they went in. I duly arrive on set. We're about to film. We got some Hawaiian Japanese speaking extras playing the, the main guy of the hand uh, and the other two other Japanese actors. And, and uh, they, they're sort of looking at this and saying, this is, uh, this is very formal. If this is formal Japanese as it would be created, this is, I, I, don't, I don't think we could do it. Great. We go on set. I meet the director again because everything is so secret. I've been I've been fed false information who the director is, who the writer is, and so I I thought she was um, not who she was, and I, I I I called her the name of the lead actress who was playing Electra, uh, and she looked at me. Like, uh, we carried on. I did the scene, fine. I got the lines out, fine. We're in between takes, they're rejigging the camera. And the producer, the AD comes up to me and with this Japanese girl and said, this is Miso. She is your language coach. She is going to help you with your Japanese. It turned out she had been appointed to me two weeks before we started filming. But because of Japanese culture, she couldn't felt she couldn't come to me to offer her help, that it was for me to come to her to ask for her. But Marvel had never told me of her existence. I didn't even know she existed. And she said, everything is wrong. Your phrasing is wrong. Your emphasis is wrong. Your pronunciation is wrong. You're speaking it like it's Chinese. So for me, this was as though I'd been told, okay, you're going on stage to do Twelfth Night. Uh, and just as you go on stage, you're told it's Romeo and Juliet. You're not doing Twelfth Night, go. And of course, you, have, you don't know the lines. Somewhere in between all of this, we managed to put it together. And how we did it is, thank God, I was on the telephone because right at the end, I did Wild Track perfectly. And they were able to add that at the end. 
Um, and I then sat down with one of the producers from Marvel and he said, we thought you could speak Japanese. I said, but how could you think I spoke Japanese? You, you, the, the, the agent, the casting director sent you the self to me. You could see I don't speak Japanese. He said, no, we know now. <laughs> and I thought, oh, crikey, that's it. You're going to kill me off. Um, but no, I lasted for another, another six episodes, five episodes. I think it was six in total. Um, Charlie Cox, an absolute delight. So deserves to be where he is. I'm so thrilled, as you are probably aware, as a result of Spider-Man No Way Home. He is now looking very set up to take over where Ben Affleck left off and have his standalone Daredevil feature film with Charlie as Dedder. Um, he's, he's a real leading man. He was so lovely to work with. The scene when I'm, I spill my wine over him, we're waiting to rehearse and something suddenly pokes me in the back. And, uh, and I turn around and there's nothing there. And then something pokes me again. And Charlie had opened up his blind stick and he was poking me in the back. And when I turned around, he folded it up, pretending he hadn't done anything. So he's very good at making you feel at ease. He was exceptionally good. Whenever we had breaks, when we were at lunch, one lunch break, he would sit with all the extras. One lunch break, he would sit with all the stunt performers. One lunch break, he would sit with the camera crew. One lunch break, he would sit with his fellow actors. He really knew how to be a leading man. And uh, he's so charming. He's so talented as well. So, um, and Marvel do look after you. They did look after me. Bar the fact I wasn't speaking the Japanese they wanted. They took very good care of me. Um, and very interestingly, the character I was playing, playing Stan Gibson, I found out that the writer, everything he is involved in as a showrunner, he always has a character named Stan Gibson, which is my character, which is the name of his best friend. And apparently with all but one of the programs he's worked on, Stan Gibson always dies in the show, which I don't know quite what that means. <laughs> With relation to his best friend, but um, but yeah, Daredevil was was a, was a great joy, and the Tick was that was quite something because I was parachuted in in less than twenty four hours. I don't know what happened. It was never told to me what happened. I have to assume a named actor was engaged on it and had to drop out. And I, I received the script, and I didn't get it till they didn't confirm it till ten o'clock the night before, and I was due to be on set at seven o'clock to start filming at nine. And, and there was nothing there. there was, it was the first episode and it just said, Dr. Karamazov speaking in Armenia. And I said, well, what's Armenia? And they said, don't worry. Um, ben, the, the writer, Ben Edlin, we will meet him and he'll explain. I duly arrive, I'm brought into the office, I meet Ben, we're having a conversation, but we never get to talk about the language. When the producer, Barry Josephson, you'll know is the producer of Men in Black, and uh, produced the original live action, The Tick, um, with Patrick Warburton, I think that's correct. He came in and, and, and Ben said, there's someone here who really wants to meet you. And, and, and Barry burst in, grabbed me and hugged me. Because I didn't, and this is the funny thing, he was the producer on Turn, on, on Turn Washington Spies with the uh, Jamie Bell, which I was also in, but we never met. <laughs> so to this day, I think, did Barry think I was someone else? I, I don't know, but he is a lovely man. I was duly taken onto set and we're, we're about to go. And I had to improvise in Armenia for the scene, the, the holograph of Dr. Karamazov talking to Griffin and the Tick. And we're about to go and I said, Ben, what is Armenian? I don't, what is Armenian? And he said, well, it's a cross between Czechoslovakian and Portuguese. And go. And it was like, uh, and again, I was, I don't know how much of me was meant to be in the series. It did grow. Uh, and, and thankfully, you know, I walked away from that. And he said, it's great. He speaks Armenian. Uh, and um, it sort of, it, but I wasn't allowed to speak any Armenian after that. And I think it's because the grip on camera had a Russian girlfriend. And because when I was on set, he kept speaking with a Russian accent 
and I was talking, improvising with Rush with Romanian. He thought I spoke Russian, and I think they then got concerned that I was actually speaking words that I shouldn't be speaking. So in the end, any apart from that opening sequence, uh, the Armenian improvisation I did after that scenes was was taken away. But uh, I was meant to come back in season three, but sadly we stopped at season two, uh, and we we can only imagine this happened because of the boys. It was quite extraordinary, but none of the Amazon none of the, the sort of executives at Amazon looked at a single frame of the second season. They didn't watch any of it. They just cancel it. Uh, and it can only be because Boys is another anti-superhero series that they really wanted to promote. I can't think why else the tick was suddenly removed. But they are working, Ben and Barry and Peter and, uh, and Griffin are really pushing to try and get the tick to come back for another channel to pick it up and carry it on. So yeah, I have, I have been very fortunate. And that's at the end of the day, as much as it's about hard work, this industry is about luck uh, and, it, and being in the right place at the right time and, uh, and getting some lucky breaks. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to have had that. So what's next? I don't know. I, I don't know. I did an audition yesterday for a George Clooney production, um, which is The Boys in the, in the Boat, which is a fascinating project. I don't know why it's not been made before. And it's about the Olympic winning rowing team, Americans Olympic winning rowing team in 1936, uh, based on a New York Times bestseller um, on this subject. It's a true story. It is America's chariots of fire. It, it is, the script is brilliant. Um, and it's one certainly to look out for for next year. It's filming this spring. So uh, that is, I, I, whether I, it's with me or not, I don't know. But I can certainly say it's one for you to watch out for. And for me, it's got Oscar written all over it. And uh, George Clooney's directing that with his, his partner. That they directed the Tender Bar, uh, a Tender Bar together. So um, thank you again very much, John, um, and for both of you for inviting me. Um, I, I hope I've, uh, I hope uh, <laughs> I've given you what you want to. Um, but thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. Cecil, how are you? Cecil, uh, John wants to tell you something. He really wants you in the picture because he has watched bait and he loves that show. I love it. I love it, bait. I love it. Oh, oh really? Bait. Bait. Yes. Me cambió, are... la, me cambió la vida totalmente cuando ya inicié con el tema del cine en el 2016, que la pude ver. Créame que me cambió mucho la vida. Yo quiero de, en la cámara agradecerle. Y siempre se le agradecido con usted y con John porque él hizo producción manager. He watched it uh, like in the 2016. Um, and this is one of the short films that made him say, I want to do movies and short films. And he stand, he want to thank you. Of course, he want to thank John. And please. We are going to take the picture for the social media so we can share this interview. So please give us your most beautiful smile. Cecil, please. Thank you. Uh, and of course, Thank John. John, John Yatenjo wants to Thank have you. you. You gave us the opportunity to give to an interview later. Please. A pleasure, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. No, uh, thank you. So you when I'm left out in Colombia, which I intend to, I will reach out to you via John. And in fact, I will translate everything. And in fact, uh, likewise, if you find yourselves in Los Angeles, please. You know. And it will be great to work with Rachel Ziegler, but if you can, in fact, John asked me to tell this. If John got the money, so how he want, he will give you the first Siempre. role. For Always. For and in fact, before we are, we end, there is a, some kind of Colombian director or actor that you admire. Which um, Colombian actor or director that you admire? Oh, well, yes. For mm -hmm. having worked with him, Edward Ramirez. No, but he's from Venezuela. Oh, he's from Venezuela. No, don't worry. I, I, I had oh, the yeah. feeling. Rachel Zegler, for a start. 100%. Uh, 100%. I mean, she is going to be such a big star. There is no doubt about it. I mean, she is fantastic and she's such a, a lovely genuine soul as well 
you know. Uh, I was very fortunate. I saw the screening of West Side Story with BAFTA, with her present, doing a Q&A afterwards. Wow. And uh, it was, she was fabulous. She was so on it, and um, she spoke so well about the project, uh, about herself and, and how she, she, she felt for being part of it, uh, and what she felt, of, uh, how important it was with for Latinos and Latinas um, to show that, you know, because they very, very rarely get as much coverage and to have brought them together in this particular vision of West Side Story that Spielberg had. Um, no, she, she is, I, I really cannot wait to see much more of what she does beyond Snow White, because I know there's, there's a greater depth to her than that, you know. But, so John, so John, yeah, then you beat the best share from today, the share from the Colombian team. We lost. Uh, in fact, I think we are not going to to the month to to the World Cup, but it's okay. Um, it's crazy it's because really I good. choose one share from Mexico because we had okay. the look to interview Monica del Carmen. She uh -huh. is the actress from New 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 Order. No, New. New New yes, Order. The New Order, that movie that won in Cannes yeah, 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 those yeah, yeah. years, she, she's amazing. No, okay. John, thanks, claro. thank you for being part yeah. of this beautiful and small project. And, and I will translate everything, don't worry. And yes, we want to see you in Colombia or sometimes in, the, in Los Angeles. Yeah, please. And John, I will come and work with you, John. Absolutely. You John, que trabajará you. contigo. There you go. Oh. And, thank you. And we will wait for Cecile in the channel. Very good. Very okay. good. Okay. Thank bye thank bye. You. John. Ciao. Gracias. Ciao. Gracias a Michelle, tu manager. Ah, thanks to Michelle, your manager. For uh, a pleasure. All this I will pass that on. Gracias. 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 My pleasure. Gracias, caballero. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.